So it seems that this question is testing our understanding of what happens when you estimate a ratio. A ratio has a numerator and a denominator, and in this case, uh, Joan is estimating both. And the question is, how, how does that affect, like when you're estimating both the numerator and the denominator, what impacts do those estimates have on the overall ratio? And you're saying that it could be more than half, for example, if the uh, yeah. distance was closer to five miles and the time was closer to, or the speed, excuse me, was closer to zero. Babar, if the statements told us that the distance was exactly five miles off from the actual distance, and statement two said that the speed was exactly 10 miles per hour off of the actual speed, would that change your answer? The thing that you missed is that without knowing the actual distance, there's no way for us to tell how big of a deal is uh, five miles, right? If the actual distance is a million miles, eh, five miles is basically uh, unnoticeable. If the actual distance is five miles, then estimating within five miles of that is a huge deal. I mean, that, that would completely change the picture. And the same goes for the speed. If we know that the speed is the speed of light, then being within 10 miles per hour of the speed of light, you're basically accurate. Like that's basically it. It's not much of a rounding error. But if the actual speed is 10 miles per hour, then going plus or minus 10 will, will completely change the picture. So algebraically, if you wanted to look at it that way, you could say, look, I have some x, the actual distance, and let's say plus or minus five miles, and we want to know what happens to the ratio when you have that over, let's call it the, the actual, sorry, the actual speed, s, plus or minus 10, and the problem is that without knowing how big of a deal five is in the context of x and how big of a deal 10 is in the context of s, there's no way for us to uh, make any inferences about the overall ratio. And another way to kind of explain that algebraically is, you know, if you have a plus b over c plus d, there's really no way to kind of talk about a plus c separate from b plus d. You can never split the denominator. You could split the numerator. You could say that that's equal to a over c plus d plus b over c plus d. You could do that. But that plus in the denominator can't be broken up. So that's another way to kind of explain why uh, even when you combine these statements, and even if we knew exactly what the estimates, uh, how off the estimates were, we still wouldn't be able to answer this question. And the correct answer is E. It, it, would, it would just totally depend on the values of A and C. It would depend on how big of a deal is B in the context of A, and how big of a deal is D in the context of C. That's what it would depend on because, uh, and, and by the way, when I say how big of a deal, uh, one way to think about that is uh, what percent of the original is the estimate. So for example, if you said, like if, if these numbers up, uh, if, if this number and this number were given as percents instead of as actual quantities, Right? If, they, if they said Jones' estimate for the distance was within 5% of the actual distance. Jones' estimate for her average speed was within 10% uh, of, her average, of her actual average speed. Then we would be able to say that the uh, time estimate was within some percent of the actual time. I won't go into the math because that's beyond the scope of the GMAT, but then we would be able to make some kind of interesting inference like that. And the reason is because then you wouldn't have, like looking at the algebra, you wouldn't have B and D anymore. You would just have A with some, let's say 0 0.05 times A, and you'd have in the denominator C plus or minus some 0 0.1 C, something like that. So you would only have two variables, you just have some 
number of A's divided by some number of C's, and that you would be able to compare to the original A over C. What they're testing in this question is, do we understand that when you're looking at a ratio and you're making additive changes, additive changes to the numerator and denominator, all bets are off. We have no idea what's going to happen to that ratio because the additive changes, we, we don't know how big of a deal they are in the context of the original ratio. And just to illustrate that with a different example, if we say that the ratio of boys to girls is 3 to 2, right? And then we say, uh, you know, five boys are added and uh, three girls are added. So these are additive changes to the numerator and denominator of a ratio, right? And then the question wants to know, what can you say about the new ratio of boys to girls? What inference can you make? And I think we can clearly say that we wouldn't know what the new ratio is. But it's not just that we don't know what the new ratio is, we can't even give a range for the new ratio. Like we're, we're completely in the dark here because we don't know whether the original ratio of boys to girls came from literally three boys and two girls or whether it was three million boys and two million girls. Now if it was three million boys and two million girls and we're just adding five boys and three girls, it's basically not gonna change the original ratio. I mean, it would just be a rounding error. You would just say the ratio is still three to two, basically. Because adding five boys, so okay, so now I have three million and five boys. I have two million and three girls. What's the ratio of boys to girls? It's practically still three to two. On the other hand, if you only had three boys and two girls in the beginning, and now you have eight boys and five girls, well, now the new ratio is eight to five, which is very different from three to two. So all this is to, to illustrate that making additive changes to the numerator and denominator of a ratio without knowing the actual numbers in that original ratio is uh, really not informative at all. Like it, it really just depends very much on how big of a deal the additive changes were in the context of the original numbers in the numerator and the denominator. So in my opinion, that's what this official GMAT question was designed to test. There's only one inference that you can make in a scenario like this, when you're adding to the top and the bottom. The inference is that the ending ratio, the, the new ratio, will be somewhere in between A over C and B over D. It ends up being a weighted average because we're doing a, an average of two ratios. So uh, let me give you an example, okay? When, uh, on the day that I was born, my dad was 26 years old, which is approximately 10,000 days. So let's say that uh, on the day that I was born, the ratio of my dad's age to my age was approximately 10,000 to one. Then we, uh, the time passed, the time moved on, the years went by, and eventually I reached exactly the age that he was when I was born. So he was 26 when I was born. When I reached age 26, how old was he? He, at that point, had lived 26 years twice. Once without me and once with me. So he's now 52. So we started out with a ratio of 10,000 to 1. He was 10,000 times as old as me on the day that I was born. But 26 years later, well, now the ratio of our ages is 2 to 1. Fast forward another 14 years, because I'm 40 now, he's 66. Ratio of 66 to 40 is less than 2 to 1. It's like 1.6 to 1 or something like that. So we see that as time goes by, the ratio of his age to my age, which started out as 10,000 to 1, continually gets smaller and smaller. It was 2 to 1 at one point, then it kept getting smaller, and now it's like 1.6 to 1. If he and I both live forever, like a million years from now, if he and I are still alive, what will the ratio of our ages be? He'll be a million and 26. I'll be a million. The ratio of our ages will be practically 1 to 1. 
we'll be the same age. We'll be both very, very old, right? Uh, ratio of one to one. So why is that? Why does this ratio that started out as 10,000 to one get smaller and smaller over time until if you go all the way to infinity, it will just be one to one. And the answer to that question is, so we started with a numerator and a denominator, it was 10,000 to one, but then we constantly are adding the same exact value to the top and to the bottom because my dad and I are aging at the same rate. Every year that passes for him, one year passes for me. So this is exactly that kind of scenario where you have a starting ratio and then you're adding, you're making additive changes to the top and to the bottom. In this case, those additive parts have a ratio of one to one because everybody ages at the same pace. So the new ratio, when, it, when it's all said and done, the new ratio is going to be some kind of weighted average between the original ratio of 10,000 to one and the ratio of the additive parts, which is one to one. And the more of that new ratio we're adding, the more of that one to one, bigger those additive parts are, the closer the new ratio will be to that ratio of the additive parts. Therefore, the new ratio, the ending ratio, will always be somewhere in between your original ratio and the ratio of the parts that you're adding. That's right, and we, we can write this as a, as a rule if you, if you like. So we'll say you know, A, B, C, and D are all positive. That's important. Let's also say that A over B is less than C over D, just as uh, conditions for this to work. So if all of that is true, then it will always be true that A plus C over B plus D will be somewhere in between your original ratio and the ratio of those additive parts. We could prove this algebraically, but that's kind of beyond the scope of the GMAT, so let's leave it at that. I, I much prefer to think about it uh, via reasoning, right? the, like the story about my dad's age and my age, I think is a much better way to, uh, to think about this um, property. I see what you're saying. Uh, so just think of it as the other way around. I mean, just call this the 10,000 to one. Yeah, the ratio of the parts that you're adding to the top and the bottom is uh, the original ratio will start looking more and more like the ratio of the parts that you're adding. The more of them you're adding, the more that starting ratio will want to look like that new ratio. So it's going to end up somewhere in between. So just to wrap that question up in a bow, neither statement can possibly be sufficient on its own because statement one doesn't mention the speed and statement two doesn't mention the distance. But even if we combine them, we can't possibly answer the question because we don't know how big of a deal five miles is in the context of the real distance. And we have no idea how big of a deal 10 miles per hour is in the context of the original speed. So therefore we can't make any inferences about how far off the actual time her estimate was. And therefore the correct answer is E. So on a question like this, we can definitely apply some logic to eliminate some of the answer choices. Does either of you see how we can do that in this case? Take it one step further, JD. You, you know that 50 is 10 below 60. So would you want the other speed to be exactly 10 above 60? Or less than that or more than that? You should think about how much time you would be spending in each of the 20 miles. And we don't know exactly how much time. I mean, we could figure it out, but just ask yourself, what would take longer? Would the first 20 miles take longer or would the last 20 miles take longer? That's a good inference. So because the distance is the same distance, the slower speed will take more time. So they're going to spend, or this driver will spend longer at 50 miles per hour than he does at the other speed. 
So the answer will definitely not be 70 because 70, answer choice C, would be correct if the, if the driver spent exactly the same amount of time at each speed. Then it would be 70. So we can eliminate C based on that, but we can take this one step further. We can figure out whether the uh, higher speed should be farther away from the average speed or closer to the average speed compared to where 50 is relative to the average speed. 50 is 10 away from the average speed. So the higher speed at which we spend less time should be closer or farther away. Let's draw a number line and see if that helps. So we have on the lower end, we have 50. And we know that the driver is spending more time here. And on the higher end, we have some question mark. And we want to know where does 60 go? We know we're spending less time here. And we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing if the distances weren't the same. But the distances are the same on purpose. It was designed that way to give an advantage to people who reason this out. So the distance is the same distance. The lower speed will then take more time because it's slower and it's the same distance. So I drew this number line showing 50 on the low end, question mark on the high end. If we know that the driver is spending more time at 50 than at question mark, that would mean that the average of 60 should be closer to the left or to the right? 50. Exactly. The average will be closer to the speed at which you spend more time. And now which answer choices can you eliminate? Look at our number line. We know that this distance is 10. Therefore, this distance must be more than 10. So the question mark must be exactly. It has to be more than 70. Because an average speed is a weighted average of the two speeds where the times spent at each speed are the weights for the weighted average. So for our purposes today, this is all, this is as far as I want to go with reasoning. And the truth is that for this question, I probably wouldn't even use reasoning. It's a simple enough question that you could just solve it with a formula. But I still wanted to go through the reasoning because it'll be very valuable in other harder questions. For this question in particular, you can just say, well, the total distance is 40, because 20 plus 20. The total amount of time spent must be equal to the distance divided by the average speed. So total time is two-thirds, or 40 minutes. That's the big inference that we can make from... 20 miles plus 20 miles, an average speed of 60 miles. We can make the inference that the whole trip took 40 minutes. Now that we know that, we can go back to the first piece of information there, where we know that the speed was 50 miles per hour, and we can now infer how long that part took. How long would it take to cover 20 miles if your speed is 50 miles per hour? Uh, Two-fifths of an hour, or 24 minutes. So first part took 24 minutes, leaving us 16 minutes for that last part. So why would that last part take 16 minutes? We know that it's 20 miles. So 20 miles divided by what is 16 minutes? And you solve for the question mark and you're done. Yeah, so you solve for question mark and you get 75. So the uh, average speed is the ratio of the total distance to the total time.